This presentation explores the years leading up to and during World War I. The war will change almost everything about society. We will go into the war as the last of the 19th century and emerge modern 20th century people. It's possible to consider 1908 as the year modern fashions began. That year, fashion abandoned the S-bend corset shape brought about by the straight front corset. Just two years later, by 1910, women's bodies will no longer be torqued or pushed into unnatural shapes for the sake of a construction of ideal beauty. The two corset styles on the right show us the difference in those three years. Modernism will bring rapid fashion changes in 11 years, cycling through four silhouettes. This reflects the rapid changes not only in the world, but also in the roles of women in that world. This image summarizes these changes occurring every two to three years. As the Belle Epoque S-curve straightens, the kimono sleeve is introduced, giving women a more comfortable fit and effortless line. The kimono sleeve is not tightly fitted at the shoulder. It is cut all in one as an extension of the blouse, or a larger rectangle is added to the blouse. More progressive fashion will use a larger sleeve, more mainstream fashion a smaller sleeve. As we have seen, the fascination with Japanism beginning during the bustle era led to a change in aesthetics in art and decor. It will finally make its mark in fashion as more than a decorative effect. The kimono sleeve frees women from restrictive tight sleeves. The first silhouette is the sheath style, referring to the relatively straight shape of the body and tubular style of dress. As with every new style, some women will resist this change, so we will see both the sheath silhouette and a modified S-curve overlap for a few years. In 1907, a fashion event rocked the world. Couturier Paul Poiret introduced the sheath dress in Paris. He would become one of the most influential designers of this era. He is fashion's first bad boy avant-garde couture designer. Before this, avant-garde fashion, such as artistic or aesthetic dress, was worn by a few people outside of mainstream fashion. He brings rebellion right into the French couture. He trained at the House of Worth and founded his own fashion house in 1903. Poiret designed fashion for thin, youthful figures, not the matronly S-curve style of woman. Overnight, everyone felt either very modern or very dowdy, and by 1908, the style was more or less mainstream. And this is the beginning of modern fashion. Poiret was responsible, or took credit for, a number of fashion firsts. Poiret's sheath dress was a neoclassical or directoire revival style using thin fabrics, a straight skirt, and an extremely high waistline that also minimized the bust. This is a bold statement after the full monobism shape of the early 1900s. And this is the second time the classical style was revived in the name of creating a new modern shape for women. Another modern and quite avant-garde detail is the sheath style was worn without a corset, once again rejecting the artificial shapes women had contorted their bodies into. By 1909, the mainstream version of this style is widely adopted and predominates until 1911. Like all avant-garde fashions, relatively few people wore this most extreme style, famous hostesses, models, and actresses in France who were extensively covered in the fashion press. In French fashion, this era is called the Empire Revival, looking back to Napoleon's empire during the first neoclassical revival. And so now we call this high waistline an empire or empire waistline. 
I've given you two versions to look at here. On the left are high-end designer fashions that look effortless but are complex to create. The fabrics are very thin and use fine decorations. The desired effect is to create a delicate dress that appears to drape on the figure effortlessly. The top and bottom are contrast colors to evoke the feeling of a blouse and skirt. On the right is a very affordable mass market version of the sheath dress made with more serviceable fabrics. The top and bottom are also contrast colors. The waist is a little lower and it has less decoration. The hallmarks of the sheath style are the loose fitting top and the tubular skirt that fits smoothly over the hips. Sleeves end at about the elbow or just below it. Necklines continue to feature the very high delicate lace collar. This can be a chemisette under the dress or attached to the dress itself. And we see a new neckline style called a jewel neckline that just hugs the neck. We will also see V shapes and square necklines with many dresses featuring two necklines to add complexity. What did real women look like in these dresses? Some women did not embrace the slender sheath skirt. All three of these photos are dated 1912, and it shows the range of styles worn in real life. On the far right, we see a wealthy and fashionable aristocrat who did embrace this style. It clearly requires a slender and youthful figure, as well as a life of leisure, to wear this style. The women on the far left have pretty much ignored the new sheath fashion. They continue to wear the S-shaped blouse with gathers in the front. They kept the bell-shaped skirts from about 1896. They have, however, given up the straight front corset, if indeed they ever adopted it, and their posture is fairly straightforward. I love how these women look. They have clearly created their own style. The women in the center wear a compromise style. They wear the shorter, looser sleeve and open necklines. One wears a higher waistline than the other. Their skirts are just a little wider than the tubular sheath. This is an example of mass manufacture making slight adaptations to suit the practical middle-class market. In 1911, we have another cultural event that will change European fashion and popular culture. The Russian Ballet came to Paris for several years in a row, and in 1911 they performed the ballet Scheherazade with costumes designed by Leon Baxt. The designs caused a sensation in Paris as they saw a fantasy interpretation of Oriental costume based on the Arabian Nights. Once again, a fascination with exotic fashions would alter Western fashion design. Designer Paul Poiret fell under this spell of Orientalism, and it will appear in his fashion lines and in his stage costumes. The second fashion silhouette for this era was inspired by Poiret's designs for another ballet, the tunic line or minaret style. A minaret is a type of tower built as part of a mosque, and the name alone evokes Middle Eastern exoticism. We see one version on the left from the ballet he designed. The original version had a wired skirt hem to make it stand out. It could be worn over another skirt or harem pants. After the ballet opened, Poiret created versions for wealthy women to appear at the most chic parties and in theatrical events, again covered by the fashion press. He incorporated it into his fashion line after it was an enormous sensation. He called it the sorbet dress seen on the right. We now sometimes call it a lampshade dress. This extreme form was not worn by many women, but it changed fashion overnight. In 1911, Poiret threw a party that made all the fashion news. It had the fashion impact of the Metropolitan Museum's gala red carpet now. 
the fashion press covered the event titled The 1002nd Night After the Famous Arabian Tales and inspired by Scheherazade. This photo shows the harem-style pants, turbans, and robes he created. Only the most daring fashionistas adopted these styles for their own social events. One such fashionista was the American heiress Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney, who commissioned this ensemble on the right. If you are a fan of the British TV show Downton Abbey, you may recall the episode where Lady Sybil shocks the family by appearing in an evening gown with Poiret-inspired harem pants, showing that she was a daring young woman indeed. Mainstream Paris couturiers immediately created their own versions we now call the tunic line or minaret. The tunic refers to the shorter layer that ends around the hips. This is a softer version created by draping and layering instead of the wired overskirt. These have a very sinuous, snake-like feeling. Between 1910 and 1914, Poiret released several versions of this dress. The underskirt became very small at the hem, and so it was called a hobble skirt because it caused women to walk in tiny, mincing steps. Some women wore straps around their legs that you can see at the upper right to keep their steps small so they wouldn't accidentally tear their skirts. Many fashion historians have found this ironic. Just as women gave up the corset, fashion asked them to bind their legs. Another possible inspiration for this was Catherine Wright. She flew with her brothers, the Wright brothers, to invent the airplane, and she tied her skirts together to keep them from flapping in the air. The upscale fashion market incorporated the new couture tunic line in a more modest manner as two skirts, an overlayer and underlayer, with the volume over the hip and thigh. The fabrics are soft and drapey. Some overskirts were made of multiple layers. Soon it would be copied at every price point. The tunic line lent itself very well to ladies' suits with longer jackets, creating the tunic shape over a more slender skirt. Another aspect of the tunic line included a skirt with a wider hip called a peg top skirt. This was available for hidden slits for walking or it was made in the hobble skirt version. The war began in Europe in 1914, bringing wartime restrictions. The fashion parade will not stop entirely, but the mood is distinctly more sober. The shirtwaist and skirt and sheath dresses predominate, especially for women who are doing wartime jobs. In 1915, fashion introduced the third silhouette, a large skirt that astonished some critics because of the amount of fabric required to make it during wartime. Women embraced this style, and it was an immediate sensation. The barrel silhouette is sometimes called the wartime crinoline. The biggest news of all is the shortened hemline, well above the ankles. The fashion press trumpeted this style was patriotic to lighten men's hearts in troubled times with short skirts and cheerful dresses. The wartime crinoline also embraced a rococo revival. At the left you can see an 18th century original and on the right the new version. Both of these dresses feature a ladder of bows on the front bodice, as well as wide skirts made of very light, lofty fabrics. The designer Lucille, or Lady Duff Gordon as she was really named, was particularly known for making delicate dresses in the barrel silhouette. The Lucille dress is very delicate, featuring fine nettings to create sheer sleeves and underskirt. The barrel style was worn at the same time as the sheath style, on the left, as some women chose one or the other. On the right, we can see more conservative versions of the barrel dress that are not quite as wide as the couture version in the center image.
In 1918, we see the fourth silhouette emerge, the chemise dress. The volume of the barrel style collapses to create a simple, slender dress. Some styles retain the overskirt layer of the tunic line ending just below the hips or longer. Throughout all these styles, women still wore blouses and skirts, which followed the prevailing silhouette each time. Wealthy women wore silk blouses with fine construction details and decoration. More affordable blouses are made of cotton and linen. Buttons are becoming a favorite decorative motif for sporty or tailored clothing, as you can see on the left, in both skirts and blouses. The blouses on the right show necklines are open, revealing a strand of pearls or beads, and fine embroidery or decor. These flat graphic motifs were influenced by the arts and crafts movement and Art Nouveau. These blouses show that a slender bust line was the more desirable shape. American women add another important item to the mix of skirt, blouse, and jacket. The sweater used in sports teams and the, and the military was a functional garment that allowed ease of movement and practical warmth. Although sweaters were promoted primarily for sports, women quickly adopted them into their everyday wardrobes. Women knitted socks and sweaters for soldiers and themselves during the war, and knitting wool suppliers sponsored instruction manuals for fashion garments too. As we noted with men's fashion, this was a homegrown way of dressing that did not originate with the Paris designers. Europeans visiting the USA noticed that Americans valued a healthy and sporty appearance as a form of beauty, and sweaters were a part of this look. Young women and modern women abandon entirely the confining corset during this era, using an early form of the brassiere for support. Many women, however, continued to wear a corset because of the smooth, slender hip line of the sheath and tunic style dresses. The lighter fashion fabrics left less leeway for imperfections. On the right, you can see the corset loses the function of pushing the bust line around, but encases the abdomen and hips instead. It is evolving into the girdle. Who invented the first brassiere is a matter of historical argument. Paul Poiret claims to have invented it, but we also have a patent by Mary Phelps Jacobs created with triangular cuts of fabric. They were particularly useful for evening gowns, which were made of very thin fabrics, and many layers would have shown through. We add a new item to the everyday wardrobe, the slip. As dress fabrics grew thin and even sheer in some places, the slip allowed more modesty and smoothed over the fittings of brassiere and girdle. As hemlines grew shorter, stockings took on more fashionable aspects as well. The common everyday stocking was black or white cotton that was sturdy and easy to darn or wash. Note they could be worn with light or dark shoes. Silk stockings were the most sheer and available in many colors, but they were expensive. Many women saved silk stockings for special wear, choosing cotton for every day. The two main hat styles from the Belle Epoque remain as staples here, the toque and the picture hat with a broad brim. The brim turns downward toward the face and all the hat styles sit closely over the eyes. One new hat style is a soft derby style with turned up brim, but a cloth crown. Other interesting hat styles include the extremely large brim hats of 1908 to 10, called peach basket hats, picture hats, or merry widows. The inverted hat looks like a hat turned inside out to stand like sculpture. And the mushroom hat features a tall crown made of soft materials. Hairstyles frame the face with curls. The most fashion-forward women begin to cut their hair short, such as movie stars and young trendy women, 
This bobbed hair was considered extremely daring. Traditional or conservative women continued the pompadour styles from the Belle Epoque era, but they were considerably deflated. Some women pinned their hair to look shorter on the sides as if it were cut, but most of the time it was still long enough in the back to wear decorative buns or twists. During the 19-teens, women piled their hairstyles more vertically, once again, into pompadours. Some styles featured rows of crimped curls arranged in patterns. Girls wore their hair down in curls or braids. Putting your hair up for the first time was a big event for young girls. It meant they were becoming young women. The tam hat, or the large beret you see on the right, is also a popular style for young girls. Fur accessories took on a larger scale from 1908 through 1919. Muffs grew to large sizes, and a matching stole and muff were very fashionable as a set. The most fashionable pieces included the entire pelt of the animal, with heads, feet, and tails artistically draped. Women's shoes will be available in two style categories, a pump or dress shoe and the Oxford or walking shoe. The fascination with fur will also lead to a trend for exotic animal skins and we will see shoes made of alligator and lizard. High top shoes will revive after the introduction of shorter skirts. Contrasting two-tones will be a favorite. Heels were available in several heights. Toes were extremely pointed. Swimming and bathing suits offered women some freedom from everyday cares, although fashion plates were careful to show only fully clothed, modest women in stockings, caps, and even special shoes. But photography tells us another story. The standard accepted bathing suit was a tunic over bloomers or trunks. We can see the woman in the center has bloomers that end just above the knee. But we can also see that she dispensed with the idea of stockings in the water. Local officials occasionally imposed rules how much above the knee a bathing suit could be for public decency. Women who swam seriously on teams adopted the men's bathing suit style, a one-piece ending in shorts, as you can see on the right. This would be considered immodest for public places, however, but it serves to show us that fashion advertising played to a preconceived notion and did not always reflect reality. This concludes our look at women's fashion from 1908 to 1919. The rapid changes in society will bring large changes in women's fashion. We will end this era with skirts above the ankle and women freed from being encased in corsets.